assembly. How to build a custom truck. Take this, put on that. There. Seems pretty straightforward. sentimental and junk. This is the last time I'm going to be driving this truck. But sacrifices must be made. Okay. Stripping down a vehicle is a relatively straightforward process. You should know in mind or have in mind what stays and what goes. Things like this fender and stuff like that and the door, those are kind of trash, so they're gonna go away. I already have replacements hiding up upstairs, but things like the bumper, uh, all the rest of that good stuff, it all needs to stay here. I need all the sheet metal because that's what I'm using, so it's basically just fenders, the cab, the bed, and most of the front end on here. I'm keeping all of that. Everything else can go. I think I'm just gonna start on the engine because it's gotta come out anyway. It's going away for a core, but it's also keeping me from getting this cab off of here. So cue the time lapse. definitely found some interesting things stashed away in vehicles over the years like cruising through junkyards and stuff like that but this is a first for me I've never ever found a bag of mysterious white powder stashed away in a vehicle I felt so dirty afterwards either way the rest of the strip down was pretty much you know as simple as it gets tear everything apart get it all ready for the next day got it all cleaned up I was here till about midnight or so and it took the majority of about half a day to get everything stripped down and ready the cab off of it the bed off of it the whole works but the next day is where it all came together or apart I am not allowed to play that music. Uh, I wish I could, but rest assured, I was definitely jamming out while I was slicing this thing apart. But these are some things that we need to talk about. When it comes to slicing up the body, there's a lot of things that you need to consider. First and foremost, bracing. I didn't put any on here before I cut it up. That's not to say that I shouldn't have, but we are building this based on a completely leveled jig, and it means that I have a little bit more work to do if I skip the bracing. It just means that I have to take extra careful measurements and all kinds of other stuff. Now, should you add bracing to yours? Probably. The thing is, most modern vehicles, and you should know which one you're doing and which one you're cutting up, and you should find the answers to this before you do it, but most modern vehicles all have their structure externally on the body. There isn't much structure that's actually on the floor, the rear, or the firewall itself. There's not a whole lot that's in there. It's just sheet metal. So in this case, the B pillars, the sills, the A pillars, and sections that stretch up into the roof have all of the structure in them, including sections of the rear of the cab where it goes through here all of that is structure and portions of the front of the cab up top here where the wiper cowl and all that is that's all structure so all of the sheet metal can be completely eliminated from this piece right here and still remain relatively intact now again if you're not sure or you want to be extra safe you should have at a bare minimum three tubes that run through here 
one from A pillar to A pillar across that way, one from B pillar to B pillar across that way, and one from B pillar to A pillar diagonally stretching to the opposing side. That's at bare minimum if you're only cutting up something that has A and B pillars in it. If you have A, B, and C, and even D pillars, you'll want to do that too. You'll want to do the exact same thing and triangulate them all the way across. If you want to get extra special and technical on it, you can do a B pillar lower to B pillar upper, an A pillar lower to A pillar upper, and an A pillar lower to B pillar upper, diagonal or going to the opposing side. This will triangulate everything and keep it all in place. Everything, you know, right where it needs to be and extra square. But since we are going onto a completely level jig, that's why I didn't use any of the bracing. But if you're not sure or you want to be extra safe or whatever the case is, then add bracing. I, on the other hand, can get away with it. Now, as far as chopping up the sheet metal, this is one of those things that I really like to pay attention to. Where do I need to cut it? What do I actually need to cut out? You should probably know for your build where you want to cut everything out at, but at the same time, if you don't, or know specifically, you don't want to cut into anything structural. Most floors and everything else like that are not necessarily structural components. Some vehicles, they kind of integrate them. Some vehicles, they don't. So something like the Mighty Max, for example, as I mentioned, earlier, most of the structure is in the actual external sections of the bodies. I typically go around chasing all of the pinch welds. Anytime that I see a place where the structure meets a piece of sheet metal perpendicular to that section, that's the closest I want to get to the structural side of it. I can get as close as I want with the saw, but I got to be very, very careful when I'm actually slicing it out because if I cut into the actual structural section, I may get layers and layers deep on it and I might not be able to put it back together, which could compromise things. Now, if you remember back in the days of season one, I always followed a golden rule that says very simply that you can always take metal away but you can't necessarily put it back on thing is if you cut into something structural you're going to be in a heap of trouble so you got to be very very careful of where you cut and how you cut it Additionally, it may be a lot easier if you just cut things out in small sections. So I already attacked the firewall and I pulled that out into one section. I attacked the rear section of the cab and I pulled that out in one section. But the floor of it, I sliced down the middle and then pulled them off side by side. Once the cab is completely cut out, you can either choose to go ahead and grind all of it, which I didn't really want to do, or you can just toss it onto your jig and get leveling. It's helpful to have a friend or a buddy or somebody to come by to help you get everything together. In this case, I had Nick. With the body setting relatively in the place where it needs to be, I went off and immediately leveled the chassis. Pick the point inside of my shop where it's gonna sit and off we go. As I mentioned in the first video, leveling takes time, lots and lots of time, and especially now with the body just sitting on the chassis jig, you need to have this thing absolutely perfectly leveled, which means take your dear sweet friggin' time to make sure that it gets just right. You don't want to mess this up, especially if you're like me and you chose not to brace your chassis. You want this thing dead nuts as possible. The first measurements I went for was the distance between the sill on the lower pinch weld to the actual frame of the chassis jig itself. Then I went to this side. Once both of them matched, we were good to go. I was satisfied that it would be okay or it's somewhat in that place. Same thing happened on the rear. We did the exact same measurement on both sides. Those measurements are not dead on. They're not perfectly accurate or anything else like that. It just kind of gets you in the ballpark because we have to figure out where it's supposed to sit from front to rear. But there's a problem. We lost our datum point. The datum point was originally on our bumper and the bumper is now gone. So is everything that we needed to attach it to the actual vehicle. That's kind of a problem, but we still have one measurement in order to find out where our actual datum point was referenced off of or where it could be or where it actually was. The center line of the front axle was that one number that we never wanted to change and one that we wanted to get dead on. In the case of the Mighty Max, the center of the front axle is actually centered on the fender. So as long as the fender is lined up as close as possible, we're going to get that center line just right. I simply went to Google and pulled a picture. This is some thumbnail for a video, so if this dude is actually watching, thank you. That's an awesome thumbnail. I have no idea who you are, but I appreciate it. I quickly pulled the picture into a program called Enroute. This is what I use part-time for doing most of my CNC or my CAD work, my quick stuff, since it's on the fast cut. I stretched a line from wheel edge to wheel edge running across the center. Then I took a line straight up to the center of the fender, and I also did a straight line or a leveled line referencing from one section of the fender to the other section of the fender, and verified that this is actually the center of the wheel, which means it's the center of the fender. All I have to do at this point is figure out where that center line is on the fender. 
that gets a little bit tricky because we have a couple of different radii to deal with and we don't necessarily have a flat section. So the only solution is to grab a piece of poster board and trace it out. Since I'm working with a perfectly level jig at this point, I can trust the measurements that I get off of it. Once I get the poster board in place with a straight edge facing down, I can hold it up with a level and then I can verify the measurement with a tape measure based on the position of the jig. After tracing out the inside, I can take a measurement from one side to the other to figure out where my center is. Simply draw a line, cut it out, stick it back up in the fender, and translate that center line up onto the fender itself. Then I grabbed a protractor, set it at exactly 90.0 degrees. This is a digital protractor. After setting it up with the center line of the axle, I can measure the difference between the center line of the axle and the center line of the fender, which tells me how far forward or rearward I need to move this body. In this case, it needed to go an inch and a quarter to the rear. I mentioned before that you should be extremely picky about your measurements, and I mean ridiculously picky about your measurements. That means if you have to go over it a thousand times until it's dead on, go over it a thousand times until it's dead on. The slightest amount of movement, even just bumping into it or just tapping it or even giving it a little bit of a bump just to get it to go one way or the other will make it shift. That means that if you don't have your measurements dead on by the time time you install your brackets and while you're installing the brackets you're not continuously checking it's going to move on you now the brackets are actually relatively simple we don't need anything fancy or anything else like that we just need something simple to hold it in place on at least four points that will also double as a reference in the event that I have to pull the cab back off for any kind of welding chassis work or anything else like that we also don't want our brackets to interfere with any of the other tubes or anything else like that. In other words, if we install a tube and it blocks the screws, then we can't remove the body afterwards. And these are things that are extremely important and things you need to consider. My brackets are very simple. Nothing more than eighth inch plate cut out on the fast cut with a couple of holes in it. And we bend it only slightly so that way it can go from the actual rail of the chassis jig up to the inner sills of the body itself. We need to attach them to the body first, and it's really important that they don't necessarily touch or push or move or anything. They need to sit perfectly flat and even on the actual body itself. If there's a slight gap between the bracket and the chassis jig, that's okay. That can actually be filled with weld, providing that it doesn't distort. But as long as it's a nice, clean, flat, even surface for it to mount to, you're good to go. I made sure to remove all of the dirt and any other kind of grime that was on here. That way we have a nice, flush, clean, flat, even mating surface for it. Once all of them are in place, I verified my measurements one more time to make sure everything was good, everything was lined up, and we haven't moved, and I'm satisfied with the placement. After this, it's full welds all the way. Between each weld, I made sure that the body didn't move at all. If it did, you have to give it a little love tap, straighten everything back out again. Once again, verify these measurements a thousand times over until you get it just right. If anything did move and you can't just give it a little love tap to put it back together, then cut it off and redo it. I was going to put the bed on here, but then when we got it all cut out and we got it set up kind of loosely or roughly in place, I decided it's going to be in my way more than anything else, especially in the beginning when it comes to actually attaching all the tubes and welding them up and setting them all up and stuff like that. The bed doesn't need to be on there for right now. In fact, it can wait a while. So it's off to the side. So now that's two things that we've gotten done. We got the chassis jig built, we got the body onto it, and now in order to start building our chassis and getting all of our measurements, we're going to need to get the engine in there. I'll tell you what that is in the next episode because, well, it's here. I'll see you all in the next episode. Thanks for watching.